Great. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Samuel Sirocco, Program Manager for the Minority Fellowship Program at the Minority Fellowship Program. We welcome you this evening uh, for the third in a series of webinars that we've had um, provided for fellows and alumni. Um, this evening, we okay. are delighted uh, to have with us uh, the Faith Center. Uh, the topic will be what if I told you? Responding to children and adults who report a history of child sexual abuse. Uh, I would like to first introduce the executive director of our kids, Dr. Sue Fort White, um, and following that presentation will be done by the Our Kids Center. Dr. Thank you so much, Samuel. It's a pleasure to, um, to be with you all tonight. And um, it's also very exciting for us to be able to share our enthusiasm <clears throat> and our, our inspiration around our national campaign, What If I Told You. Our kids, before I begin, I want to introduce my colleagues. This is uh, Dr. Lisa uh, Milam, who is um, a forensic social worker here at our kids. She has been here 27 years, which is amazing. And this is Holly Gallion, a uh, nurse practitioner extraordinaire and also clinic director and she has been with us for 19 years so uh, that's pretty special so our kids um, is 32 years old we provide medical forensic evaluations and crisis counseling in response to child sexual abuse and um, we uh, you know this is a nurse practitioner driven uh, clinic and the nurse practitioners and social workers work um, in teams with every child and every family that, that come here. Um, every year we evaluate um, over 850 children um, and uh, we also serve 47 counties in Middle Tennessee and we have four satellite clinics that are co-located inside child advocacy centers um, in more rural areas that surround Nashville. And the other thing that I think, um, well, one of the things that makes us very special is that the nurse practitioners and social workers share on-call coverage every, um, every day and night of the year. So there is always a nurse practitioner and a social worker on call, and I think, and these are the experts, and so I think that, that makes us very, very special. Um, and so uh, two years ago when we turned 30 years old, um, and, and after evaluating over 27,000 children, we started to reflect on what we were seeing in our clinical practice. We were starting to reflect on patterns that, um, that, were, that were really, really clear. And one of the things that I think is, is just still is astounding to me is that uh, every week, and sometimes nearly every day in clinic, a caregiver will look at the social worker and say, you know, I've never felt this safe before. Um, and, and what if I told you this happened to me and I was six and it was my grandfather? Or this happened to me and I was 11 and it was my older cousin or it was my uncle or it was my stepfather. And so many things occurred to us when we were turning 30 years old as an organization. We were working with Mac Perkle to come up with ways to capture our story. And one of the things that I felt like I really wanted was uh, what I called at the time an anthem video, something that we could share with the nation about the prevalence of child sexual abuse. And, and as you will see, you know, it says one in four girls, you know, what if I told you one in four girls and one in seven boys will be uh, sexually abused before the age of 18. And you know what's what's interesting about that 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 statistic, if you will, is that because so often children uh, their disclosure is delayed, and sometimes many children never tell until they're adults, as we've seen with these caregivers who um, finally um, are able to share their pain and their story. And um, and so and so we worked and to to create a video, um, and I think that the other thing that motivates us. So there, we know that there are millions of adult survivors in in this country alone 
who um, need to be affirmed because they are courageous and they do need support. They need to know they're not alone. Um, but the other thing is so many people who have children in their lives don't really know that child sexual abuse is really an epidemic um, and they, they, they just don't know. And, and we believe that uh, you, are, you are much more able to protect the children in your lives, uh, your life, if you understand that this is an issue, this is a major issue. And if something does happen to a child in your life, if you educate yourself, and this is why we did What If I Told You, you are much more um, able to respond appropriately. And so it, it is for uh, the sheer uh, certainty. We know that child sexual abuse happens in every community, regardless of race, socioeconomic, religion, geographic location. And we know that there are millions of adult survivors that need support. And so um, it's my pleasure to prompt Samuel to start our two-minute video, and I hope you enjoy it. What if I told you? What if I told you? What if I told you something no one knows? The human journey is unique. Each life begins as a child, full of wonder and discovery. For one in four girls and one in seven boys, life takes an unexpected turn. Child sexual abuse. For one in four girls, one in seven boys. What if I, what told, if I, told, what if I told you my secret? In most cases, there are no outward signs. No one knows unless it is disclosed. And that could take days, months, years. Some children never tell. They carry the secret with them. Some finally tell, and it is a weight lifted. What if I told you it happened to me? What if I told you no one believed me? Child sexual abuse happens, but it does not define. Children are resilient if we believe and protect them. Child sexual abuse happens in every community. One in four girls, one in seven boys. What if I told you you can help? Help start the conversation. Understand the guilt and shame. Help erase the stigma. Believe the child. Embrace the adult. They are courageous. It is never too late to heal. People in your community know how to deliver care and healing for the one in four and the one in seven. What if I told you? Learn more. Go to whatifitoldyou.com. Pass it on. So, um, so the other, the other part of this desire to do something generous and, you know, wonderful um, for this country was that we knew that we needed um, something to hold this video. We couldn't just push out a video. And as it turned out, we have um, friends in Nashville, some very creative people who do a design-a-thon every year, and it's a 12-hour it's a, a uh, uh, sort of pop-up creative and they chose our kids and they designed, you know, the, they designed this website for us um, as a gift. And so the graphic designers, web developers, and content people, uh, we spent 14 hours uh, one day and one night and it, was a, it, was, it felt like boot camp to me, but it was, it was a very exciting process. We were very clear about the fact that we were designing something to hold this this uh, this video, we did not aspire uh, for this website to be um, exhaustive, but we did aspire to for it to be robust and for it to be um, uh, you know easy to navigate. Our only goal with this campaign is to reach as many people as possible with 
information and resources about child sexual abuse. And, and our, very, our very great uh, uh, assertion is that information is power and resources are medicine. And so as you look um, at, there are three sort of bucket tabs we like to call. One is I need information, one is I want to share the information, and one is I need help. And I do want to, uh, I, I do want to uh, direct your attention to the I need help um, button, if you'll click on that. Right. So, um, so uh, there are national links um, on on it, throughout this this whole um, this whole website, and I think in in particular under the I need help, the the links that are present are the suicide prevention hotline, RAIN, which is rape, abuse, and incest national network, national child traumatic stress network, national child abuse reporting hotline. National Association of Child Advocacy Centers, because there are, I think, 881 across the country. And if you click on that and put your zip code in, it, it gives you the ones closest to you. We're also linking to Psychology Today um, for mental health supports, as well as National Board of Certified Counselors, or NBCC, the National Sexual Assault Hotline, and Darkness to Life. And um, and so um, so under these tabs, um, uh, it's sort of go up. Yeah. So so there there are things about um, you know a child just told me. It's about how to respond. Um, um, it's just some basic things that we have learned in um, in our practice over the years. And I think that part of the real message here. There are two messages, believe and protect the child and embrace the adult because they are courageous. And um, so, yeah, if you go back and there, there is um, a tab for, um, for teenagers, there's a tab for LGBTQ youth, um, uh, yes. Um, there, and, and, you know, and of course there's a tab um, if, if someone needs to, uh, to, if they're worried about a child in, or if they need to report, there's also um, the capacity to do that. Um, under, let's see, where are we? So, um, under I want information, um, many of, um, or you, if you can click on what if I told you up there, I'm gonna, yeah, it takes you back. So under um, I need um, information. So some of these things are are um, have been rebranded uh, for this campaign, but things that we really um, have always talked about. And um, a lot of the facts about child sexual abuse. You know, part of what makes this issue so complicated is the fact that 95% of the time the perpetrator is someone that's known and trusted by the family and or the child. And so that's, um, it's confusing for the child um, and I think many times it's part of, it's part of why disclosure is delayed. Um, uh, and it's also, you know, in our, in our clinical practice experience, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really not the minister, the coach, or the teacher. Um, it's usually the stepfather, the, parent, the, the father, the grandfather, the uncle, the stepdad, the mom's boyfriend, that kind of thing, or the older cousin. Um, there are also, on this page, under safety tips, we created um, a, um, a piece of collateral material because we, we saw in our, in, in our practice a terrible trend of pre-adolescents and young adolescents being lured into terribly dangerous situations by apps on their phones. So we have safety tips about keeping kids safe online. Um, uh, and, and, and all of this is, there are downloadable um, versions of all of this. So I think that, I guess what I'd like to do is invite everyone um, uh, to, uh, you know, to visit and explore 
the what if I told you website, you know, when it's convenient for you. But it it is we have gotten great feedback from, from across the country uh, from uh, mental health folks, um, uh, all sorts of people um, that say this is a treasure trove of resources. So um, so yes, yeah, so I am I'm proud of it and I'm happy to share with all of you this evening. So can we go back to the our little cam? Oh, sorry. You all should be seeing that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, we can go back to the PowerPoint. It should it, it's loaded now, and you all are able to navigate it. Awesome. I think, and, and if any, this is Lisa Milam, and if anybody has any questions, I mean, I'm I'm keeping an eye on the chat box. Uh, it's certainly fine to put that out there as we go. I mean, we can wait till the end, but it's okay to to interrupt us if anybody has any questions. Uh, and we put together just a, a pretty brief PowerPoint to try and hit some of the, the highlights. Um, and, and essentially, what we know is that lots of healthcare providers are going to encounter, uh, in fact, most healthcare providers are going to encounter either an adult or a child where there's a concern of sexual abuse, whether it's for the child that you're seeing or an adult who's an adult survivor. Um, here at the Our Kids Center, we provide services for children when there are concerns of sexual abuse. We do the uh, a forensic medical exam, um, which involves both the physical exam that's conducted by nurse practitioners, as well as a psychosocial uh, or mental health uh, evaluation to assess any emotional or mental health needs that a, a child or a family might have. We're an outpatient clinic of Nashville General Hospital. Uh, we're also a not-for-profit. Uh, our Kids, Inc. is our not-for-profit arm. Uh, we're affiliated with Vanderbilt Children's Hospital. Uh, if we have children that require exam under anesthesia or um, some other higher level of, of need, we will see them at Vanderbilt. Uh, again, I think uh, Sue mentioned earlier, we see around 850 to 900 kids a year. We're on call 24-7. There is no charge to any family for our services. Uh, and, and again, like we said before, we see, have both nurse practitioners and social workers that uh, will provide services to each family. We have five locations in Middle Tennessee, three or four of which are in our surrounding counties. Uh, most people, if you're not familiar with Tennessee, uh, I think it'll make sense that most people in Tennessee think of three sort of grand divisions. You have the uh, West and Middle Tennessee and then East, and we are obviously covering Middle Tennessee and cover 47 counties in this area. The the one thing that is interesting is how child sexual abuse is even defined. And it's different in every state. And Holly and I you know, wanted to make sure we really communicate that you want to be familiar with your, your local state laws uh, in Tennessee. And some of this is specific to Tennessee. In Tennessee, any child 12 years or younger, if that child is a victim of any type of sexual contact, that is considered child sexual abuse. And for children 13 to 17, if the alleged perpetrator is a relative or a caretaker or someone living in the home, then that child is considered a victim of child sexual abuse. For those kids 13 to 18, there's another set of, of um, or another uh, crime, I guess, that uh, occurs with those kids, whether it's statutory rape or rape. Uh, which it doesn't matter the relationship with the alleged perpetrator. It's a sexual crime, but it may not be reported to Child Protective Services because of the, the relationship to the alleged perpetrator. It's really very different in every state. And so you, you do want to make sure you know what your laws are in your particular state because it affects what your responsibilities are with respect to reporting to Child Protective Services. 
And we would say that you just sort of err on the side of caution. If you ever have a concern about a child, regardless of age, regardless of relationship, report it to Child Protective Services. If it's not something they investigate, they will refer it on to law enforcement. Um, so, so you can sort of use that as your, your default to always refer to Child Protective Services. Uh, so there are different kinds of sexual assault that can occur. Um, there are a lot of different myths about uh, <coughs> child sexual abuse, and I'll let Holly jump in to talk about the, the first couple of myths about uh, genital injury and trauma and biological evidence. Okay. Um, and I may sort of jump around a little bit because I, I think as a nurse and I've been in this field for 19 years, but I think we testify a lot in criminal court cases. And probably the two things I think about the most that people don't understand, well, actually three, one of them is kind of under one major heading. The first one is that children are going to talk about sexual abuse right away. So disclosure is going to happen immediately. And I think the second big myth is that kids are going to be touched or injured in some way that you're going to be able to look at their body, perform an exam and see some sort of physical evidence or injury. There's also going to be in the world right now of television programs like CSI, people have a great misunderstanding on the recovery of DNA or biological evidence, forensic evidence. So I, I think there's lots of things that families come to us believing and being confused about um, that are simply not true. And until you're in this field and working um, with this population, it, I think the myths are pretty pervasive. Um, and I, did you talk enough about the physical signs, um, injury? Go back. What should we talk about? Um, stranger, I, assault. stranger assault. Well, I think, yeah, you know, That's good. a lot of the media coverage, uh, I think almost every case where there's a stranger victim, a true stranger victim assault, uh, it's going to probably be highlighted in, in front of the local news. media. And in reality, it's incredibly rare. Um, it, it's just incredibly rare. And at the same time, uh, and for those folks in the audience who may be researchers, it's also interesting when you think about how to operationalize that term, stranger. Mm -hmm. For example, we, it hasn't been that long, you know, a few days ago I saw a child who had been communicating with someone um, online. And this person told her that he was 17 years old. This went on for several months, actually. Um, they make arrangements for him to come to Nashville, only to find out when he gets here, it's a 32-year-old man. Now, if you're classifying that offender, do you classify him as a stranger or as an acquaintance of this child? In my <laughs> mind, it's a strange stranger. <laughs> But it's not like this is somebody she had never encountered before. I mean, there had been an ongoing verbal or, or uh, electronic relationship. So when you think about stranger, how do you define that? And I think if you have a broad definition, then obviously it's going to include a lot more. But that true, never had any contact with a, a person stranger before. Stranger in the park. Yeah, stranger in the park is incredibly rare. Um, and I, I think it really, to me, social media and, and just the, the Internet has changed dramatically. Um, the world of assault in children. And I think it's because of situations like Lisa talks about, we see all the time kids who have connected with people on Facebook and kick um, and, and all sorts of other social media and they begin to get to know each other and then they view themselves as in relationships and often at times those are not peers or teenagers, but they're adults that are um, taking advantage of children and only until they meet do they, do they realize that the risk and what can happen. Um, but it, it is really, I think, in the 19 years I've been here, dramatically changed. Really, the way we define stranger. Because <laughs> it used to be more the person in the park or something like that. But now, I, I would agree with Lisa. And I, and I think the other thing that we have with uh, technology and, and electronic media, or, or access to electronic devices, is even sexual behaviors. Um, the, the sheer number of kids that will present to a healthcare facility with sexual behavior problems is, is pretty overwhelming at this point. And, um, and we've also gotten to a place in society where there's any touching of the genitalia 
and, and people begin to sort of freak out and we act as though sort of the world has come to an end. You know, I have a, a situation where a five-year-old at a daycare has touched another five-year-old at a daycare. And I have one parent screaming that her child has been horribly assaulted by another child. And, and I think there's, there's got to be some movement back to, to a little bit of middle ground here, that there's lots of inappropriate sexual behavior that occurs. It's not okay, but it, I don't want to elevate it to sexual abuse either. And then you also have kids with sexual behavior problems who are uh, either acting out things they have seen, um, in some cases may have been victims of sexual abuse, but more often than not, uh, at this point, it's acting out things they have seen. And it's important to keep in mind that your patients, especially your, your young patients, and honestly, it's as young as six or seven or younger, if they have an electronic device, you have to know they're going to be exposed to pornography. It's a given. It's not a question of if or, or anything. It's just a matter of when. And for most kids, exposure to a pretty significant, sophisticated pornography is going to happen long before their first sexual experience with a peer. And we really want to be encouraging people parents to start having those conversations with kids so that they understand none of that is real. The stuff they see online, it's no different than, you know, wrestling or stunt, you know, whatever it is, stunt people on, on TV, you know, movies where you have outrageous things happening. None of that is real. And the same is true for the sexual scenarios that you see online. It's not real. And kids need to understand that so that when they see it, they at least have an, a, some frame of reference or some lens through which to view and understand what they're seeing. Because uh, they're, they're going to be exposed. That's, it's just, it's out there. I, I, we rarely see kids anymore where they haven't, I have a parent tell me they're looking at pornography and, and parents are torn up and, and shocked. Well, of course they're looking at pornography. Uh, Part of that too, though, is, is learning how to control your kids' devices. We have parents all the time saying, well, she's not going to, I don't want to get her password because it's her phone and she's 10. So I think, I think we try to provide information to families about how to, well, we developed a piece of literature, how to keep kids safe online. And I think it is kind of empowering parents to be parents around electronic devices and phones and, yes. and technology. Um, because they may access it, but if you've got control and you're, you know everything that they're seeing on their phone, at least you can address it in a timely manner. Yeah. And controlling the screen time. Yeah. You know, one of the probably the most simple things is kids do not need their devices in their bedroom at yeah. night. Yeah. Um, no. They just don't. Um, and we could go on all day long about electronic devices. Make no mistake, it, I could go on all day long. Before about you go to the next slide, just a couple of the other bullets. So, so one of the things that I think is really fascinating is that there are typically no behavioral or physical signs that a child has been sexually abused. I would say more often than not, I have parents tell me there's not a change in school behavior. They're eating and sleeping well. They're not acting any differently. Sometimes you'll have changes, but then those changes may be simply based on other stressors in your life. They're not specific. Um, to indicate that this child has been sexually abused. Um, so I think you have them. If children are engaging in adult-like sexual behavior with each other, I think that is concerning and can be something, something that um, families need to address or, or investigate a little bit. But we see kids all the time that there was absolutely no indication that anything was wrong. And it is months or years before children come forward and tell their families. Um, the, the other sort of myth is most of the kids we see, most of the cases never go to court. Well, what is the percentage? Less than 5% Less than five uh, ever have any sort of legal outcome, um, and they're difficult to prosecute. It's often a child's word against an adult's word because there's typically not forensic evidence. Um, it's, it's basically the statement from a child and the statement from an adult. So they're, they're hard to manage from a legal perspective. Um, one of the other things that we always try to highlight when we are training people is the idea or the, the concept of questioning kids. You know, it's important to give kids information. You know, things like it's okay to tell if anyone touches your, your private parts or, or giving them names for their private parts. 
giving them that basic information. But when it comes to questioning children about whether anything has happened, I don't think we can stress enough that you have to be really, really careful. Um, there are lots of, I guess, rules or guidelines or things we would say need to be in place about that. Because normal behavior for most healthcare providers is when a family comes in and you're seeing the child, you just start talking to the child. Well, if the parent is in the room, uh, it's probably the single uh, most common error that healthcare providers make is questioning children about possible sexual abuse when a parent is in the room. Mm -hmm. And uh, questioning the parent when the child is in the room. Questioning the parent when the child is in the room. Mm -hmm. the the mm -hmm. the room. Um, we just can't say that strongly enough, that if you don't have any other option, we would encourage you not to do it. Yeah. If you can't find a way to talk to the parent privately or the child privately, then we've got a bigger problem. And because you, you really can't talk to both of them there. If you do, you're creating difficulty for, uh, for investigative tasks later on. And you're creating difficulty for that family. Because if a parent is talking to you about their child and their child has disclosed or reported some type of sexual abuse, chances are that parent is upset, they're emotional, uh, they're angry, and they may be saying things in front of that child, things like, you know, I'm going to kill that SOB. You know, he, she says he was touching her. You know, and, and if you're like us, you've seen parents just sort of go off with, with no filter at all. You've got a child listening and a child hearing that the parent is going to kill daddy or kill an uncle or kill granddaddy or a brother or their best friend, that child is going to pretty quickly withdraw, take back everything they've said, and, and not report what's happened to, happen to them because they see the parent so distraught. The parent is not behaving weird or in any abnormal fashion, but it's one of those things you have to be mindful of. With kids, even the most simple questions, and, and if this doesn't ring true, then I, I, well, I know it's going to ring true. When you have a child in your office and you ask that child a question, how many, how many of you see that child, the first thing they do is look at their parent. It can be something as simple as how old are you? What did you have for breakfast? What did you have for breakfast? And they look at their parent. And parents can do all they can to try and remain objective, neutral, or whatever. It's just not possible. Uh, it's not possible. So there, there are lots of other things we could talk about. Um, those are sort of the basics. And again, I want to make sure we have time to get through everything. But if you really want to, to think through what you're doing, if you're going to be questioning a child, and I think a, the next slide will um, offer some guidelines about sort of what age children uh, can understand what types of questions, uh, but be very, very careful. The other thing is document. If you do have a parent who's reporting something to you, document and be very clear. For example, if a parent says, you know, my child was in the bathtub and said their, you know, their private part hurt and that, you know, uh, Uncle Tommy put his finger in, in her private part. You want to ask some questions of that parent. Specifically, what did the child say? Did the child really say, Uncle Tommy put his finger in my private part? Or did the child complain of pain and the parent then ask questions? You know, has somebody hurt you? And the child starts shaking their head, yes. Well, who hurt you? Was it Uncle Tommy? Was it, you know, yes, yeah, so-and-so and so-and-so. And finally we get to Uncle Tommy and the child nods their head, yes. Well, what did he do? Did he stick something in your private part? Yes. You know, a child is just nodding, and, and pretty soon you find out that the child never made any statement. The child simply nodded yes or no to a bunch of questions they were asked, which is really different than a child saying, you know, Uncle Tommy put his finger in my private part. So be careful to document, and, and for young children especially, particularly under about age five, document whatever circumstances brought that, um, you know, caused that child to be talking for, again, if a parent tells you the child said something, what was the child doing? What was going on when the child made this statement? Were they in the bathtub? Was it bedtime? Were they getting ready to go somewhere? Were you on your way to someone's house? What was happening that seemed to prompt that statement? Uh, because later on in the investigative phase, those are the kinds of pieces of information that can be used to help that child communicate more uh, 
uh, their experience is to know what are the things that are prompting their their memories of the event. Um, and again, any number of these things we could or I could talk all day on. Um, this is what we talked about with some of the guidelines, and, and this is not ours. This actually came from a uh, a, a text. Well, I won't. I think that I think there's a citation somewhere else. But anyway, um, with and I would say ignore even these two. If the child is under five, mm -hmm. don't even think about questioning them, because I I can assure you. <coughs> Precious little you do or say or get from that child is going to be helpful. Um, if you're not experienced doing this, if, if you're not sort of known to be the person who can do this, don't even think about questioning them. Uh, it will do nothing but create difficulty more often than not. And we don't interview here, here at we the don't. clinic. We do not collect medical histories from children that are under five. Uh, unless I know I'm going to be the only one questioning that child. We don't question those kids. Now they may say things that are that are um, important to document. I mean, there are times you walk in the exam room and a three or four year old just sort of throws out there, you know, so and so did this to me, and, and they'll throw a statement out there. Document that, you know, somewhere, and and let that child talk. It's okay to let them talk, but but refrain from pursuing them with questions. Uh, and again, the older the child, the more you can begin to think about, you know, who, what, when, where kinds of questions. Um, but the I think when, how, don't you think how many times and when we typically will say, did it happen one time or more than one time? But we would never ask a child the number of times something happened to them because they're just not good with that. They're, they're going to give you a number, but it's not necessarily going to be accurate information. So why put them in a position of having to say something that may or may not be accurate? Because you, yeah, and, and even the when, yeah, kids really are not very good historians, particularly with temporal concepts. Um, <laughs> we had a child the other day, and we said, "Do you know the first time?" And she she said something like, "Well, it was when I was eight. She was eight when we saw her. Well, do you know the last time when I was eight? Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right, we'll go with that. <laughs> or, or a lot of times you'll ask, you know, well, well, when did this happen? Well, when we were outside." Mm -hmm. You know, so just be very careful about about language and, and think through what you're going to ask it. If you are making a decision to question a child, do sort of what we call minimal facts, you know, and again, think through, is it even necessary? If you can get the information from the parent, I, I'm not sure with any age, unless it's an adolescent, that you need to be questioning the child. I would separate the parent and the child and get information from that parent, and then that can guide you. Do I need to make a report? Do we, does this child need to be referred for a medical exam? I think you can get almost everything you need from the person that comes with the child to that evaluation or appointment. And if the parent walks in saying, I brought little Susie because I want her to tell you what her dad's been doing, that, that's when you really need to stop. Uh, when, when a parent is prompting a child to tell what happened. Um, to, when you do hear about disclosure or statements from a child, um, one of the things I try to encourage people to think about is think about just even your own personal self. And I don't know, you know, I don't know anything about the audience really, but how many people in the audience right now want to answer some of these questions? I mean, who all is willing to come online right now, even in this webinar where it's fairly anonymous, we don't know you, you don't know us. And answer these questions. You know, when was your last sexual contact? When was your first sexual contact? What kind of contact occurred? Did anything go in your mouth? I mean, how many adults in this this webinar are willing and able right now to answer those questions and do so honestly? We're asking kids to do things that most of us are not able or willing to do. Uh, many children never report. Um, the one thing in terms of, of research that we know without a doubt is that delayed disclosure is the norm. Almost no children report immediately. It is one of the biggest myths that we fight. If, my, if this had happened, my child would come and tell me, and every parent says it. I'm very close with my child. My child's my best friend. She tells me everything. She tells me everything. They just don't. Um, 
there's there's no other way to, to put it. It's not to say that some haven't, some do, there are some, but by and large, um, kids do not tell immediately. Um, and, and oddly enough, the, the younger the child, the more likely there is a delay. Young children who report typically do it accidentally. You know, little kids will say something accidentally. Uh, the older the child, the more difficult and the longer the delay. And the other thing, and this goes back to about questioning kids, um, about the language that we use. Um, I mean, again, think about just the difference in what words mean. And, and I've got a couple of examples. You know, touch and close. Whenever you use the word touch, most kids think that's with fingers. You know, you say, did someone touch your private part? They may not consider touching with an object or a penis touching because hands are what touch. Was it on top of your clothes or under your clothes? Well, underwear may not be clothes to a child. Those are underwear. A bathing suit, that's not clothes. You know, clothes are like a shirt and pants. You know, it, and then the other thing about responsibility. When we talk to kids, we're really careful that we ask questions in a way that we put responsibility where it lies, which is with the adult. You know, and again, for example, and this is one of the more difficult things for kids to report. You know, instead of saying, did you put your mouth on his private part? I mean, who does that put responsibility on? It puts it on the child. You know, the question is, did anybody put anything in your mouth? Um, it's the same information you're getting after, but it's, it's two different ways to say it. I had a call today, and this is from the father of the child. He called to say that his 13-year-old daughter had been having sex with a 29-year-old man. And I had to sort of bite my tongue because that's how law enforcement officers make that referral to us. It's how health care providers make that referral to us. And I'm just going to ask, I can't hear obviously, but does anybody in the audience know the problem with that question? You know, we've laid responsibility on that 13-year-old. You know, the real referral to us is, I have a 29-year-old man that has sexually assaulted a 13-year-old girl, and I need to schedule an appointment for her. It's not, I've got a 13-year-old who's having sex and she needs to be seen. Just the, the way we talk about things uh, communicates a lot, and it communicates a lot to kids. Um, so be mindful of language if you are in those, those scenarios. And I wanted to say one thing uh, that I forgot to say at the beginning. One of the one of the reasons why we wanted to do the What If I Told You campaign is because it is very clear that there is so much <coughs> shame and stigma and suffering around this issue. And even with, you know, a, a, a seven or an eight year old, I mean, there is, they, they do feel shame, they feel confused, they feel frightened. You know, perpetrators of child sexual abuse are very good at what they do and they're very manipulative. And, um, you know, children do start taking on. Well, and most of the time it's somebody that they know, care about, and or love. Yeah. And so they love certain parts of that person. Yeah. Um, maybe it's their father. They love going to see their father every weekend. They don't love what's happening there. They don't love the sexual abuse. But yet you will have kids continue to say, I still want to go see him. And a parent says, well, she kept wanting to go over there. Why did she want to go over there? Well, because she loves him. It's complicated. Yeah. Um, again, it goes back to it's not a stranger assault. It's, it's a person that, that is known and loved to the family. And I think with kids, when they don't tell right away and then it keeps happening, then it sets up this cycle of, well, I didn't tell right away. Well, I didn't tell the second time or the mm -hmm. fifth time or the tenth time. And then they begin, as Lisa said, and soon to take ownership of that. And it makes it even harder to come forward with this. And one of the, you know, we have also, and on our website, and you're welcome in our website, www.ourkidscenter.com, how to talk to, to children. The number one thing that every parent, every adult, every health care provider, <laughs> provider say to kids, we think about, oh, we're going to educate kids about child sexual about abuse touching. and body safety. And so we get little seven-year-old you know, Sally, and we say, don't let anybody touch your private parts. It's really important because they're private parts. They're your private parts. Don't let anybody touch them. Can seven-year-old Sally stop 30-year-old Tom from touching her private parts? No. 
She can't. So what happens when she gets touched? Well, I wasn't supposed to let anybody touch my private parts, and now I have. So we, we really try to encourage parents, or we don't try, we do, we encourage parents to have a different conversation. Because what you really want is for that seven-year-old to go and tell an adult if anyone touches their private parts. And that's the message is it's okay to tell mm -hmm. if someone touches your private parts. And who are some adults that you can go and talk to and, and have a child identify, you know, mom, dad, teacher, you know, doctor. Uh, and again, it goes back to language. And we've already covered some of the slides that's up now about, you know, getting history from parents and caregivers and children. Uh, the other thing you want to get for purposes of reporting, and, and this is going to be true regardless of what state you're in, you know, just the basic who, what, when, and where. Um, as much of that information as you can get to provide to the CPS or Child Protective Services uh, investigators or authorities when you make that report, all of this will be helpful for them. If you don't have it, that's not the end of the world, but it's best as much of that as you can get so that you can provide it during the referral. And everyone, I think my next one, is there a slide in here about reporting? I'm not sure. Just to, and I may come up on the slide, I'm not sure, I don't remember what we put in here. And I, again, I think this is pretty safe to say for every state. I know it's certainly true for Tennessee, but most states have some sort of mandatory reporting everyone is a mandatory reporter. If you have a suspicion of child abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse, neglect, you're required by law to report that. It's not something you can farm out to someone else. Uh, it is your responsibility. Um, that, that's just, there. and again, there may be one exception to that somewhere in the country, but by and large, everyone is a mandated reporter. And you don't have to know for sure it happened. You have mm -hmm. to have enough of a concern, or if you have a parent that comes in with a concern, that's enough to make a report. And sometimes I think parents and families, they don't want to make that report. They will often come to us and say, they'll say, well, I just, I just want to know if it happened. And if it happened, then I'll make a report. And then we go through, well, we probably can't tell you for sure if it happened, because most of the time kids have normal, healthy bodies. We know it happened because children tell us they do, that it did. But I think sometimes they want us to be the reporter, and, and we're okay with that. We will tell them to also make a report. But I think you're always going to be protected, or, or I would think so, across the country, if you are making that report in good faith, that you have enough of a concern or someone presents to you in health care and they have a concern, that go ahead and make that report. We're going to move on a little bit to sort of what goes on with parents. Uh, you know, oftentimes the first thing a parent worries about is if, if they find out about sexual abuse or have a concern is they'll think if I report this, my children are going to be taken away from me. Um, it's probably the number one thing I hear. It is. Um, and it's mind boggling. I mean, it could happen to a child, you know, at school and a parent is worried they're going to come take my child because that parent also feels guilty that they've somehow let this happen to their child. Yeah. It's not that parent's fault. And again, there are exceptions to every rule. There are some parents who see it happen, they know it's happening, and they do nothing to stop it. But those are pretty rare and, and few and far between. Most parents, um, it's hard to see what's happening right under their nose, and they really don't see it. Um, they're concerned, and, and, and all these are the things they're worried about. You know, Primarily, am I going to lose my children? How did I let this happen to my child? Those kinds of things. And we try to have a lot of compassion for those parents. Uh, it's, it's very possible to, 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 to be aware that if sexual abuse is happening in a home, then obviously there are some things about the family dynamics that need to change because the way it was brought us here. But that's very different than blaming and shaming a parent. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very possible to talk about how did we get here without blaming and shaming. Blaming and shaming never helped anybody. Um, and again, here are some more just sort of beliefs and thoughts because if, and, and, and the problem with parents where it's a rough spouse, I mean, who in this group is married to an offender? Who would marry someone who is a child offender, a child molester? Well, nobody. I mean, you know, when you're talking to a parent, keep in mind they're really no different than we are. 
I mean, in my mind, I'm not going to leave a child with someone who's a sex offender. I certainly am not going to be sleeping with somebody who's a sex offender. I mean, those are, are all true for the parents and families whose children are victims of sex offenders that are living in their home, and yet they really don't see it. Um, it's no different than being in denial about substance abuse. Um, you know, you have spouses who are alcoholics and, and, you know, their partners never know it. They don't see it until, you know, we crash and burn. And one thing that I wanted to say is that as Lisa is going into, it, you know, the, the very things that make this issue so complicated and so, and so dense, um, an appointment at our kids is not a 20 minute transaction it it lasts an hour and a half and or, or to sometimes three or four hours and 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 part of why is because it takes time to help the caregiver come to ground and to um, calm down and to allow someone to sit with them without judgment and 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 which loosens the soil I always say loosens the soil so that new things can grow so so that, that parent can 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 start to tell their own story and what else is going on in the family and it's and it's crucial and you know I think we put a lot of a lot of effort into meeting people where they are without judgment and it really makes I mean it's when at the at the end of the day we are all medicine we can be medicine and we can help people that are truly distressed but it, it takes more than a minute well, and I think, I think we say this a lot, but disclosure is a process, and so many children don't disclose right away. I also think for families and parents, believing is a process. Mm -hmm. I think you don't have to be believing immediately to protect and take care of your child. And I think we, we really try hard to, and it's hard when you have families that absolutely are not able in that moment in time to believe that this would ever happen. But if they just learned about it, it's going to take some time. And I feel like we do a pretty good job in allowing that to be. And I think as nurses and social workers, to have a parent that isn't believing their child, it's it's a really hard situation, but it happens on a somewhat regular basis because we encounter the parent sometimes hours after they've been told something's happened, that maybe something's happened for years. Right so the, the child, bed. it's you, she's, she or he is used to it. They've coped with it. It's not shocking for them, that, but the parent is in complete chaos. And I think it's allowing them to be where they are in that moment. Um, that is one of the things that we do best, I, I think, when, when we evaluate children. And it's hard. Again, just some more sort of words to describe, you know, things that a parent may be feeling. And, and I think the bottom one, uh, you know, so many parents have their own history, and the one thing they've always said is, I will never let this happen to my child. And they have no idea that everything about their own abuse, and this is where we talk about trauma-informed care, everything about their own abuse and their own history has created an emotional dynamic that prevents them from even recognizing that they were targeted by an offender and they were seduced into the relationship by an offender solely for the purpose of that offender having access to their child. And, and they never saw it coming. They didn't see it happening. And, and it's in that moment they begin to be aware, you know, and, and they'll tell, this happened to me when I was a child. It's been my greatest fear. And they'll, in their mind, oh, I, you know, I, I never told anybody. You know, I didn't let it affect me. And they really don't see all the ways in which it's affected them for their entire life. It's affected every relationship they have, every decision they've made. Um, it affects everything, uh, and yet they don't see it. It's sort of, uh, again, it's like the, what is it, the frog in, in a pot of water, you know, that slowly begins to boil, and they, and they don't see it. Uh, one of my really favorite stories was when um, Holly was, um, was, communicating with, with a mom who disclosed her own history. And she, as a child, told her mother what was happening to her. And her mother did not believe her and her mother did not protect her. And what Holly pointed out to this mom, she said, look at you, you are believing your little girl and you are gonna protect her. 
and things are going to be so different for your little girl than they were for you. And it was sort because of... Because you know what you didn't have. Exactly, yeah. yes. And I think that that, is, as, as much as it's a little bit heartbreaking, it also makes my heart just sing that, you know, you can meet that woman where she was and really point out that, that was a really redemptive moment. Um, I think just a, a basic sort of who needs a medical exam. Yeah, and, and I think for me, I, I've, I was a primary care nurse practitioner for a number of years, and I'm horrified and embarrassed to say that in the four years I worked at a clinic, I remember one report to Child um, Protective Services being made in our facility regarding sexual abuse. So we think one in four, one in seven, we miss kids all the time. Um, so it, I don't think you have to know a ton about what needs to happen or even who really needs a medical exam. I think what I would recommend is you know in your community who are the experts in this field um, that you can refer to or you can call and say, hey, I've got this family in my office right now and I'm just really confused and I don't know what to do. Here's what I know. Um, so I think it's knowing your resources. Generally speaking, we um, recommend that kids get exams that have had some sort of contact to their body that could either be transmit an infection or have an injury from sexual contact. So if there's been any genital to genital, oral, anal contact with another person's genitalia or mouth, kids that talk about penetration, and then younger kids that you often don't have a whole lot of information um, other than sometimes a parent's really worried about um, sexual abuse but because of some factors that don't necessarily even seem concerning to you, um, but you don't have a lot because of the verbal skills of young children. I think if children present with symptoms of um, STDs or have any anogenital bleeding or trauma, really? Okay, keep going. Um, I think, um, there you go. Yeah. So that, I think, again, like I said, know who your providers yeah. are and, and don't be afraid to make that phone call for help. Uh, and I think if anybody has any questions right now, we're certainly happy to, to take a couple of questions if anybody wants to jump out there with one. And if not, I think Dr. Outlaw is here and is going to uh, close us out. Yes, I am. Are you done on this slide? Yeah, yeah, this is it. I mean, unless anybody has any questions. I mean, I think the biggest, the biggest message is the prevalence is incredible. Yeah. And know your community's resources. Know the, who is the designated medical expert for uh, these pediatric um, evaluations. That's the most important thing. Because remember, these guys are, you know, the, the provider of record is, uh, is responsible for responding to subpoenas and presenting expert testimony in courts of law. And so, that's why there. That's why this is a technical subspecialty of pediatrics because it's because <laughs> it's uh, technical, complicated, complicated. <laughs> so, are there? I don't see any questions in the chat box right now. This is your opportunity to do that surprise. I don't know if you guys knew I was here. I was sitting over in the corner. Um, because it's, on it. <laughs> well, I've heard this now many times because I've worked with this group on a project, and every time I listen to it, I learn something else that sometimes I thought I knew. So that's why we thought it was really important for you, um, people who are in practice or going into practice, doing the research or doing quality improvement um, projects in some place where. This might, this might be an issue that comes up and there might be some, you've learned some different ways to look at it, to think about it, and how to make life better for these families and these children who are reporting. So if there are no questions in the chat box, then we will end it. I think what, what is important to know that Samuel will be putting it up on the, um, on the web page. Oh, where are you putting it, Samuel? Right. Okay. Yes, at the end of the webinar, an evaluation should pop up um, to 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 give you to give us an evaluation of of the um, of the webinar. So, if there are no questions, is it eight o'clock?
Okay. We have one minute, so this is your last opportunity. So Otherwise, Everyone we will say good night and to thank all of you for for logging on.